welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the prequel in Rico's incredible series. And as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Grey Wolf. Let's get straight into that. Prologue A man can't hide from what he is. Part 1 A Legend Begins. It was 1927 Germany, and Eric von Wolf was an Austrian born history professor teaching at the University of Berlin. His wife Marlena hailed from old country Hungarian aristocracy. Eric was weary of the current political climate in Germany and had applied for citizenship in the USA for he, his wife, and the children Jack and Liliana. Now, Eric was a very popular professor who knew a lot about lore and legend of the old country, when it was even rumoured that his wife's family were vampire and werewolf hunters. He had even written research papers about Vlad the Impaler, and the Van Helsing legend. Marlena was a dark-eyed beauty, with even darker hair. She spoke English with a heavy Eastern European accent, while Eric's English was extremely good. Eric worried about the rise of the fascist nationalism and didn't want to raise his kids in that environment. He had also applied for associate professorships at several American colleges and universities. As he came home from work, Mylena greeted him at the door with a big smile. And green cards have been granted, and the college in North Carolina has offered you a job. Mylena said they would use her family inheritance to buy a home there, and they would become Americans. When it was 1939, and the ever-increasing tide of Nazism was beginning to affect the world, and attitudes in the USA, Eric had decided to legally change his name after obtaining citizenship, and he and his family dropped the Von Wolf, and their last name is now Wolf. And they had bought an old house on 12 acres, backing up to a property owned by several Native American families, and it had beautiful rolling hills, thick forests, and a stream. Marlena said it reminded her of the old country where she had grew up, especially at night. Eric had become good friends with the local Cherokee peoples, and they had taught him how to hunt and fish. Son Jack had taken quite a liking to Esther Barnes, also known as Fawn, and she seemed to really like him too. A year later, they were both seniors in high school, and it looked as if their relationship was a serious one. Jack had also become friends with the tribe, and was now quite an outdoorsman himself. Jack was a big independent boy who nobody messed with, and everybody knew that he and Fawn were an item. The elders had invited Eric and Jack to travel to the other side of the river to camp out for a huge annual hunting trip near the lodge that overlooked the land. As his father, Jim White Cloud Barnes, told Jack that it was time for his test of manhood. Now he and a couple of the other braves, including Will Little Chief Barnes, would be tested also. They had to spend the night on their own with only a bow and three arrows and a hunting knife. They were to bring back a kill by nightfall the next day and drink its blood. And Jack was actually excited about this. The little chief was three years younger, but he and Jack fished together and even went hunting for squirrel and rabbit. And the boys sat around the fire and listened to the elders talk about the great spirits, the Kukle Kudla, Big Hairy Man, and the Ulonga Dog Lala, Long Dog with Knife Teeth. And the elders told the boys not to venture into the Black Creek Valley, for that land, I belong to the nun, uni we or evil spirit who hunts humans. The boys were a little scared, but they couldn't show their fear in front of the others. Little did they know that their fathers and the other braves would be shadowing them throughout the night. Part 2. A Test of Courage Let's 
get straight into that. It was now sunset, and the elders sent the boys out and wished them luck and protection of the spirits. Two men were to follow each boy but stay back as far as possible. Eric and Sonny, Crowwood, were to shadow Jack, but Jack was very quiet and hard to track. He seemed to have a natural ability for this. And Sonny was Cree and went with Eric because he was one of the best trackers in the tribe. As it got later though, Jack seemed to be tired and became a little careless. And Sonny whispered to Eric that Jack seemed to be following this game trail. And Jack had travelled for hours and stopped only once to pee. And finally, this trail converged onto two other trails and Jack had climbed a tree overlooking a stream about 60 feet below him. It was about 1am and it was time now to wait and see what Jack would be able to ambush, a deer or a boar from his perch. Eric and Sonny were about 75 or 80 feet from Jack and could make out his silhouette from the chest up against the clear starry sky with a half a moon. This was a mistake that they would have to tell him about because people and some animals can spot you that way. About an hour had gone by when a commotion was heard down the hill and to the left. It sounded like more than one animal was approaching, but one was apparently bigger than the other, or others. The noise stopped, then commenced again, and this time a buck and three doe burst out of the bushes by the creek. They froze, and then it was a silence. The buck sniffed the air as the doe jerked their heads from side to side and twitched their tails. We watched Jack as he slowly knocked an arrow and started to pull back on the bow. He was acting slowly and quietly, just the way he should. He pulled the arrow back all the way and loosed it, striking the doe closest to him, just behind and below the shoulder. It jumped and gave out a distressed ball while kicking up its back feet. The other deer bolted as it spun around one last time and dropped to the ground. Jack had hit the heart and the deer was now on the ground. Sonny smiled and looked at me. Jack slung the bow across his chest and started to make his way down the tree. And just as his foot touched the next limb below him, a huge black mass burst out of the trees and pounced on top of the deer. Jack froze and gasped. It was a dogman, and it had heard Jack's gasp. It looked up at him and snarled, making a deep guttural sound. I was in shock as Sonny gripped my arm, forcing me to stay in place. He eased the rifle forward and took aim as the stare down continued between Jack and this huge wolf. Jack's bottom foot was on a limb about eight feet off the ground, and then I saw something from legend. This wolf stood up on his back legs just like a human would. Its head was almost level with the limb Jack's foot stood on and it picked up the deer with its clawed hands. It then turned around and ran off on two legs. And Sonny gave a sigh of relief and whispered for me to wait just a moment to see what Jack would do. Well, it seemed like 10 to 15 minutes, but Jack worked his way down the tree and immediately knocked an arrow and started to slowly back up the trail. As he got about 20 feet away, I called out to him in a loud whisper. He turned around with a look of total disbelief and then knelt and started shaking. I reached down to help him up, and Sonny said, Jack, you did the right thing, but we've got to get out of here. And he stood up, and I led us back as Sonny watched our backs until we were back in the campground area. By now it was almost 5am, and some of the elders were awake, and as we shared the story, all the elders gathered. White Cloud told all the men to go find the boys. We must break camp and go. Part 3. War Arrives Let's get straight into that. Although Jack was still in a state of shock, every elder and other participant told him that he did well and showed great courage and calm. A young Cree man known as White Feather brought Jack a headdress with grey feathers and presented it to him. Not many have faced the walking wolves alone, and lived, he said. White Cloud then said, Your name is now Grey Wolf. If there was any doubt that Esther's father approved of Jack, 
I was now gone. We didn't tell people about this because nobody would believe it. My wife simply said, the legends were real, darling. As Jack's senior year in high school wound down, the war in Europe was ramping up. The Nazis seemed intent on conquering Europe. The Germany we had left was now in turmoil, and many young American men were being drafted into the military and prepared for the eventual war. I really wanted Jack to go to college, but knew that because he spoke German, he would be valuable to the cause. He was almost 18 years old, and it would be his decision whether to join or wait to be drafted. Being a history professor, I had read my son's stories about the pirates of the Barbary Coast and how the Marines fought them bravely so far away from home. I wasn't surprised when not long before graduation, Jack came home from school and said he needed to talk to me, Malena, and Liliana. And he said, I'm going to join the Marines, and Esther and I will get married before I leave. But I was speechless, but not shocked. His mum hugged him and said, Son, you are a man now. You make your own decisions. On the following day, we went down to the Marine recruiter and watched Jack sign up. We then took him to the jewellery store where we bought him a wedding ring. And he would graduate in May of 1939. Our whole family drove over to the Bard's house on the other side of the Devil's Elbow to have a party for Jack and Esther. And they would get to be together for about three months before Jack left for boot camp at Paris Island. World War II had already begun, and we and Esther and many of her family went to watch Jack's graduation. Jack was sent to England as they prepped for a possible invasion by Nazi Germany. Jack was summoned to his company commander's office, and as he waited to be called in, he sat and wondered what was up. After all, he was the only American there, or so he thought. The door opened, and a voice said, Private Wolf, enter. Sir, Private Wolf reporting, sir. At ease, and be seated, said Captain Winchell. Sitting in the chair next to Jack was a young Native American Army private. At the end of Captain Winchell's desk was an Army Lieutenant Colonel and a man in a black suit. Lieutenant Colonel James Atkins stood and said, Private Wolf, relax, please. He then introduced him to the man in the suit as Mike Cochran with Army Intelligence. Also, I would like you to meet Private Daniel Hawks. So, Private Wolf, I know you are wondering what you are doing here, said Lieutenant Colonel Atkins. Private Wolf, you and Private Hawks have something in common, said Cochran. You two are the only two U.S. service members known to have had an encounter with a large upright walking wolf. Jack and Private Hawks looked at each other in shock. Private Hawks, please share your story, said Cochrane. The Hawks calmly talked about how when he was 13 years old, living on the Lakota Reservation, he, his father and uncles, took him and some other boys on a hunt. He had walked about 15 feet from the tent to take a pee, when he suddenly saw this creature rise up from the weeds and look at him. It looked like a giant wolf, but on two legs, and he froze and slowly reached for his knife, when he heard his father whisper from behind him to stay perfectly still. His father and his uncle slowly raised their rifles, and then an elder told them to lower their weapons. The elder then placed his right hand over his heart and held it out, saying, Oa Blekela, Okinahan, Shankaha, Wanaki. Peace, great wolf spirit. Well, it seemed like forever, but within a few seconds, the wolf slowly dropped back down to all fours, while making a low growl, and then turned and ran off. It had been about seven foot tall. And Cochrane and asked Jack to share his story. Afterwards, Cochrane said, Gentlemen, what I am about to tell you is classified. If you talk about this to any unauthorized persons, you will be court-martialed. Is that understood? Both privates responded with, Yes, sir. And LTC Atkins stood, and put a map of the Bavarian forest. He then displayed a picture of an SS colonel named Hans von Bühler. At the behest of Hitler, von Bühler and his men abducted this man. And holding another photograph, Lucian Moldovan. 
Moldovan is a Hungarian man who is rumored to have killed some of these creatures and kept the young ones to raise like pets. Hitler wants them turned into super soldiers to help Germany win the war. However, after initially cooperating with the Nazis, Moldovan escaped with the help of one of his pets. However, it appears he showed von Bülow enough to train them before he escaped. He is on the run, and von Bülow and his men still have an unknown number of these creatures. Their goal is to capture females and start a breeding program, and we cannot allow that. You too were chosen because you had very close-up encounters with these animals, and you, Private Wolf, speak German and some Hungarian. Is that correct? Yes, sir, said Jack. And you, Private Hawks, you're a good tracker. Yes, sir, said Hawks. Our mission is to form a team that will locate Moldovan, if possible, and use him to help us stop Von Bula. Understood? Yes, sir, they responded. Part 4. A Journey. Let's get straight into that. How to infiltrate Nazi Germany and get into the Bavarian forest was one problem. The other was how the hell would you find Moldovan? After a drive to RAF, Milden Hall Base, Jack and Hawks walked into a large hangar to meet the rest of the team. Mike Cochran of Army Intelligence introduced Sergeant Church and Corporal Hogue of Special Services. They are highly trained and also speak some German, he said. And they are going to familiarize you with the weapons that you will carry. Welcome to the UK, chaps, said Church. The four of you will trek through the old country into the dark forest, where the reports of a man with a huge wolf have come from. If you are unable to locate Moldovan and his wolf, you must trek on to locate Von Bula. You will take diplomatic fight over France and Switzerland into Austria. Once you are deposited at the Austrian-German border, you will meet with Andres Baki and Ilek Abet of the Hungarian resistance. From there, you will access whatever transportation possible into the dark forest with the help of local resistance groups. Here are your new passports. Private Wolf, you will be Jack von Wolf, and Private Hawks, you will be Klaus Berger. You will play the role of a speech and hear an impaired man who must use sign language. We cannot have you talking, so here is a booklet of sign language for you all. Fortunately, Corporal Hogue knows how to sign. Corporal Hogue will be R.E.F. Hogue, and Sergeant Church will be Christoph Kirsch. Any questions? Uh, did a Hungarian speak German or English? Sam, said Cochran, but that is where you come in. On the long flight, the men were getting more acquainted and learning about their new identities. The big question for Jack and Hawks was about their dogman encounters. And Hoag asked, Why can you tell us to prepare us? Well, there is no preparation, said Jack. You become prepared after you look into its eyes, said Hawks. The Hogan Church looked at each other. So, you men speak German, said Jack. Mostly Freitas said Church. My grandparents were German, said Hoag. Thus the name. And you, said Hoag. Well, said Jack, my father was born in Austria and taught history at Berlin U and my mom was Hungarian. Ah, interesting, the two said. And you, Mr. Klaus Berger. Well, I speak English and my native dialect, said Hawks. Why, they say you can track anything, said Hoag. Every Lakota brave is taught the way of the land, said Hawks. And so does my wife's family, said Jack. They are Cherokee and I learned a lot from them. Well, gentlemen, said Church, we should get on bloody well. Let's catch a bit of shut-eye, shall we? Well, the stewardess woke the men to the sounds prepping for London. Remember, chaps, whispered Kirsch, we are now Germans. The men made it through the Zoll I Wanderung, customs and immigration, with few problems, and Hoag had to translate sign language between Klaus and Hawks and the agent, and from the airport they boarded the train for the Kufstein railway station 
on the Austrian-German border. Becky and her baits were to meet them there. Remember, Jack, said Hope. The challenge phrase is, do you like winter? In Hungarian, to which you will reply, no, I prefer autumn. Uh, Roger that, said Jack. The men collected their bags and meandered around the park benches in front of the station. As Jack stood by a lamppost, looking at a newspaper, a slight man with a traditional Hungarian-style vest and hat approached. Zeretid Atele, he said. Jack responded. Nim Joban Zeretim, as Otomot. The man smiled and said, Address Baki, follow me, please. He escorted the men to a wagon with two horses. He introduced the man on the wagon as Elek Abate. Udvislam, hello, said Jack. The man nodded and said the same. We thought you didn't really speak English, said Jack. I have practiced, said Baki. So, how did you know it was me? Ah, he paused, looking for the words, and said, Because it is you, the so tall one, yes? Jack smiled, and the men loaded the wagon. Part 5. The Trek. Let's get straight into that. The plan was to get to a city named Regensburg, in Bavaria, near the area where Von Bühler was reported to be. How will we bloody get to Regensburg, with all these crowds around? said Kirsch. We would travel, how you say, on parallel to the main road, on the old roads of the forest. But first, we must collect the weapons. They travelled an old bumpy road in the woods until Bates said, Aish! Or stop. Back he dismounted the wagon and pointed to a spot under a huge tree and said, Here. He and Abate dug up several canvas-wrapped objects and some olive drab-filled packs. They unwrapped the two British three hundred three carbines, two Thompson submachine guns, and a 1911 sidearm for all. Do you men have weapons? Hoag said. Yes, under the wagon seat we have a Mosi Nagand rifles. So, what is the plan from here? Says Jack. To the south of Regensburg, we will meet a German man by the river. He does not like the Nazis. This German man, he knows where is this von Bühler. The men nodded and mounted the wagon. And as they rode, back he told Jack and Hoag that the challenge question was, can we get petrol here? And the German man, he will say, no, the stations are closed. Oh, ask the German man's name, said Hoke. We do not know, said Bucky. They rode well into the night, having to occasionally hide the wagon in a heavy bush when it would hear vehicles in the distance. Well, it was daylight, and they had camped without a fire, so not to draw attention. A bait had a small concealed fire behind some rocks, and the smell of coffee was in the air. Hawks asked, if Moldovan wanted to go back to Hungary, which way would he go? He cannot go through Poland or Czechoslovakia. Too many Germans are searching for him. We are travelling the shortest route, and he is coming our way. The Jack and Hawks pulled out maps and started looking at the most logical route of travel for Moldovan. Can we camp far enough from the road tonight to have a large fire? said Hawks. Why would we do this? said Bucky. I want Moldovan to come to us. Why, everybody but Jack looked at Hawks with puzzlement. And as the sun set, Hawk announced that he must trap an animal. There are many, many, and he paused. Ah, Niyal, he said. Rabbit, you mean? said Jack. And back he nodded, saying, Elek can help you. As the rest made camp, Hawk and Elek headed out. At about 7 p.m., Hawks and Elek arrived with five rabbits. Here are four for dinner, he said. I will keep this one. Jack, come with me. We will ring the dinner bell. What are you blokes up to? said Church. Make sure to find the scent to our north, said Jack. We will be back around midnight. You must post a watch. 
and Jack and Hawks were back in their natural elements. The woods. We're looking for a tar tree on the highest ridge, said Hawks. And they found their location, and Hawks climbed the tree like a cat. He then tied the gutted rabbit to the tree and started imitating a rabbit calling out in distress. This went on for almost an hour until Hawk finally said, well, Best we get back. He agreed and then rubbed the rabbit scent all over him and climbed down. Let's go, Jack, he said. And as they made their way back, he would rub rabbit scent on random trees. It was about 12.30pm when he called out that they were approaching the camp. And Hawk told the men, we should sleep light. It was almost 3am when I awoke to Hawk tugging at my arm. We have a visitor, he whispered, and we quietly woke the others. And Hawk whispered, stay where you are and pretend to be asleep, but watch every direction. About five minutes later, Hawk looked at me and pointed to our northeast. We readied our weapons and I peeked out under the wagon. And suddenly, the horses became nervous and started pulling on their ropes. And that was when Deja Vu paid me a visit. The horses were now frantic, but Elek had tied them down well and took a position close to them. Hawk and I saw the outline before the others. Low to the ground, on all fours it crept, almost undetectable. And then I saw a glint of yellow eyes. I gave Andres a sign to call out to Moldovan. Moldovan, Azad, Vagiantit, Hogi, Sejisang. Moldovan, we are here to help. The dogman roared and leapt about 25 or 30 feet landing at the front of the wagon. The horses were going berserk, and we all stood up weapons ready. Hawk and I were staring it down no more than 15 feet from us, and then we slowly lowered our weapons. The dogman made a low but powerful guttable growl. We were at a standoff when a voice called out. Goliath, Leki, no young gote. Goliath, be calm. Andres called out in Hungarian, saying that he was here with the Brits and the Americans to help. And as the giant wolf lay down on its stomach, Moldovan emerged from the bushes and said, Greetings, I am Lucian Moldovan. We invited him around the fire and offered him what was left of the rabbit and the bread. And he and Andres chit-chatted in Hungarian, and when he had eaten and had coffee, he said, in understandable English, How can I help you, gentlemen? The Hawks and I have had an encounter with these creatures in the United States. we never heard of a man taming them, said Jack. Tame? responded Moldovan. No, they are never tamed. You must make an agreement with them. You help them, and they will help you. But it bloody obeyed you, said Hogue. No, it trusted my advice. Blimey, said the Brits. We pissed ourselves, said Church. When you see something that does not exist, it is fearful, yes, said Moldovan. And they nodded. So, said Lucian Moldovan, you want to find Van Bula and the rest of the Goliath's family? That's his name, said Jack. Yes, there are two more males who are jealous of the Goliath, and one would have killed me, had it not been for him. Why? said Hawks. Goliath and I had a connection from the beginning. He was also the largest and the smartest. So, how do we find Von Bueller? said Church. Well, they have different locations. They took the dogs to a couple of villages on the border to test them. They killed almost every man, woman, and child. We are supposed to meet the man who knows the location, said Church. It's a place where two rivers meet. Yes, I know this place. It is one day's travel. When a man got some rest, I headed out at sunup. During daylight, the wolf looked even more terrifying. He was jet black with great tufts on his ears and a bit of grey streaking down his back. And Hogue asked why he looked at everybody as if they were dinner, except for Jack and Hawk. They do not fear him in the same way the rest of you do, he responded. Moldovan said something to the Goliath, and he took off through the forest as the men loaded the wagon. Oh, what's he doing? 
said Jack. And before Lucian could answer, Hawk said, Scouting. It was almost sundown, and Goliath returned, and Lucian said, Stop. We are close to the river. How do you know? said Hope. He is wet, responded Lucian. And Hawk said, We should go on foot from here. And Jack, Hawk, and Hope called up to the crest of the ridge and saw the place where the Nayap and the Nube rivers joined. And there were two men fishing, but another man was just walking and looking around. That has to be him, said Jack. Here goes. And Jack meandered inconspicuously out of the woods and approached the man. Conan Zweihir Benzin Benkoman. Can we get petrol here? To which the man replied, Nein, die Station sind alle geschlossen. No, the stations are closed. The two shook hands and proceeded towards the rest of the team. Part 7. Tracking a Predator. Let's get straight into that. And back at the wagon, it was almost dark as Jack introduced Gunter Heinkel to the rest of the men. Heinkel spoke only a little English, and so Jack and Hoag would have to translate. They told him they had located Moldovan, and as they introduced him, he saw the wolf and almost fainted. After sitting him down, Jack asked him the whereabouts of Von Bühler. He said there was a small Nazi emplacement to the northwest, where the bunkers had been converted to cages for the wolves. It was von Bühler, and his handlers along with about a dozen Nazi soldiers for guards. Heinkel kept looking towards Moldovan and the wolf and said he must ask a question. He wanted to know if this was a werewolf, and so many have seen. Moldovan replied that this animal was born this way and was not a man who transformed. My people killed their parents, and we found three puppies. My family and I kept them and raised them. But soon we discovered... They cannot be made into pets. The villagers started insisting that we kill them as they grew bigger. I refused and took them deep into the forest, where we lived mostly in peace until the Nazis came. My dogs killed several of them, but there were just too many. They tranquilized them and took us all to the deep Bavarian forest. Hans von Bühler threatened to kill all of my family members in our village if I didn't teach him and his men how to train and command these dogs. They are now well rewarded for carrying out the commands of their captors. On the following morning, they went their way with the map Heinkel had provided and a big sack of rations. They pushed deeper and deeper into the dark old growth forests, the trail becoming narrower and bumpier. At some point, they would have to leave the wagon and go on foot. So, Lucian, when we break into the compound where the wolves obey you, said Jack. Lucian looked down, shaking his head, saying, I just don't know. These wolves do never really have masters, and most do not display the type of loyalty that of a domesticated dog. There is a part human aspect to them, an ancient one, one that is sometimes evil. Goliath is apparently the exception, but he cannot be controlled, only managed, and even that has its limitations. He opened his shirt to reveal several ugly scars on his shoulder and chest. The other two males are Gaos and Drago. We will have to kill Drago. I am not sure about Gaos. It was late afternoon when Andres said we could go no further with the wagon. I will send Goliath ahead to find this place, said Moldovan. The men grabbed their packs and headed out on foot. Elek would stay behind with the horses. Jack, Hawks, Church, Hogue, Andres, and Moldovan headed out. Now the sun was sinking below the horizon, but it was already dark under the thick canopy, and they decided to make camp. We had just laid out our bedrolls when Lucian informed us that Goliath was back, and something is wrong, he said. Goliath is agitated and uneasy. We could actually see that the dog acted nervous. What is it? said Church. I do not know, said Lucian. We must all go there and see this for ourselves. All I know is that Goliath found something that we should be wary of. 
As Church started to give out watch assignments, Lucian stopped him and said, Oh, not necessary. We have a watchdog. Get some needed rest. May I give him some dry beef, Jack? said Jack. Yes, said Lucian. But be very still when you do, and talk softly to him. And Jack extended his hand softly, saying, Here, Goliath, for you, friend. He took a piece, and Jack handed him some more. And so, just for clarification, Jack was six foot four, and when Goliath stood on all fours, his shoulders came up to Jack's elbow. Part 8 Predator versus Master Let's get straight into that. It was sunrise and the men were up for breakfast, and Goliath seemed to ask Jack for a treat. Jack handed him some bacon, and he actually wagged his tail just a bit. Hawk also gave a piece, but the others wanted nothing to do with it. They set out on foot, with weapons slung, and Lucian mulled over and leading the way with Goliath. They stopped for a brief lunch, and Lucian sent Goliath ahead once more. You know, said Lucian, it takes a lot of bullets to kill them when they are charging you. When Goliath's parents were killing our goats and chickens, two men died, and my father was badly injured trying to kill them. Well, hopefully we have better weapons, said Jack. And a few hand grenades and flares, said Hoke. As they made their way, it was now late afternoon when Goliath returned. He is still uneasy, said Lucian. We must cover ourselves with dirt, mud, leaves, and whatever we find to conceal. Our sense. They can smell you a kilometre away, and they can smell a new scent even further. They covered themselves and moved on towards their objective. It was well after dark, and the team proceeded slowly and deliberately, not making a sound. And suddenly, Goliath started softly whining and laid down on Lucian's feet. He whispered that we should send a scout ahead to see what is there. And Hawks and Jack volunteered to recon the area with some field glasses. Well, it seemed like Jack and Hawks were gone for an eternity before they returned. Well, it's about two miles, said Jack, and we know why Goliath was upset. There's five cages with four wolves inside, four of them. If they are males, then we must kill them, said Lucian. If they are females, we've already mated with Drago and Gaius. We may still have to kill them. Jack and Hawks drew out a rough diagram of the compound in the dirt, and they planned their attack. And as the team crept up on the compound, they spied three guards standing and watch. There were bunkers with doors on both sides of the cages where Von Bueller and the rest of the Nazis were staying. The plan was for Goliath to swiftly take out the three guards while the team assaulted the bunkers. And Jack and Hawks would a toss a flare and a grenade into each cage, while Bucky, Church and Hogue attacked the other bunkers. Moldovan whispered a word into Goliath's ear, and he sprinted towards the guards. He slashed the first guard before he even knew Goliath was there. The beast raced on and pounced on the other man, knocking him down as he tried to raise his rifle. Goliath made one large cleaving motion from the man's left shoulder to his right hip, and leapt about fifteen feet to decapitate the other guard, as he only managed to fire one round. And then the unexpected happened. Von Bueller and his men were in the cages with the wolves and threw the doors open, shouting ineligible commands in German. Our plan, I was gone. Not only were we outnumbered, but we were at war with both man and beast. Now, apparently Drago and Gaius had smelled or sensed Goliath, and Von Bueller was ready for us. The other soldiers started flowing out of the bunkers as Von Bueller's men stepped forward with weapons. Drago immediately burst out and paused for a second to smell the air, followed by Gaius. Goliath erupted from the trees and charged for Drago and Gaius, and they barreled towards him. And as the soldiers ran out firing, Church, Hogan, and Bucky opened fire on them, cutting several down before they could return fire. Hawks and Jack had been advancing towards the cages with grenades and their Thompson submachine guns ready. And they were now facing two large female wolves, and four armed Nazis. And at that moment, Goliath, Drago, 
and Gaius collided with a thunderous sound that was audible over the sound of the gunfire. Hawks and Jack went to the prone position and tossed grenades at Von Bueller and his men, and before they could open fire, a shot rang out from the eight o'clock position. Elek had given Moldovan his Mosin Nagant rifle, when he loosed a round striking one of Von Bueller's assistants in the chest. Jack and Hawks fired full auto on the advancing female wolves. They tumbled towards them and rolled up within five or six feet. Part 9 Claws and Steel Let's get straight into that. Nine Nazi soldiers were now engaged with Church, Hogue and Bucky in a life and death firefight. Two of the soldiers opened up with their GEW-43 automatic rifles, pinning down Hogue and Church. And Bucky made a dash for a tree to get a better vantage point and fired around, killing one of the machine gunners instantly. And just as he worked the bolt to the muzzle in the gant, the other machine gunner cut him down. Von Bueller remained stationary, and his two remaining men tried to flank Jack and Hawks as he fired his GEW-43, forcing Jack and Hawks to lay flat behind the dead wolves for cover. And Hawks said, Grenades! And they each tossed one in the direction of the advancing men. The kaboom was deafening, and they laid flat behind the wolves, the shrapnel from the explosions not fifty feet away scattered in all directions. As the smoke cleared, the odds were now better as the grenades had killed one of the Nazis. Lucian was screaming at Gaius to stop as he and Drago and Goliath rolled knocking down small trees. It was obvious that Goliath could defeat either of the wolves one on one, but every time he would get an advantage on either, the other would attack from behind. As the Mauser rifles laid deadly fire all around Church and Hogue, Church gave the signal for he and Hogue to flank their position and tossed their flares to blind the soldiers. They tossed flares followed by grenades and they were able to take out two more of the Nazis. And while the smoke was still thick, Church tried to advance and the machine gunner cut him down with a hail of lead. Hogue was now pinned down taking fire from the Mauser's and the machine gun as a Nazi low crawled towards him. Moldovan pointed a rifle at Gaius and screamed for him to stop and then fired around at his feet. And he stopped as Goliath and Drago rolled, bit and slashed each other. Gaius took a swift step towards Lucian and froze with his muzzle inches from him. The wolf looked confused as Lucian extended his hand and spoke softly. And Jack and Hawks were still behind the dead wolf's bodies and were now using their sidearms to return fire. They were getting low on ammo and Jack told Hawks to concentrate fire on the advancing man to the left, and just as he moved to better conceal himself, a round struck him in the neck, and he gasped for air as blood filled his throat. In that moment, a dark brown blur came from the left to the right and tumbled Von Bueller. It was Gaius slashing and biting him. Gaius erupted into a gallop and tore into the other Nazis, firing at Hogue, tumbling them like toy soldiers. The Nazi soldier screams could be heard over Gaius's growls. And as the advancing soldier whirled to fire at Gaius, Ho put a three oh three round right into his back. Now all that could be heard was the chilling sounds of Goliath and Drago clawing and biting each other. Moldovan stood motionless and with his rifle ready to fire when Goliath shoved his head down under Drago with jaws wide open and flung his head up, clamping down on Drago's throat. The sound of the flesh tearing, and Drago's muffled shriek, oh, it was unforgettable, as Goliath shook his massive head side to side, and suddenly Drago went limp. Goliath slowly raised his head, with blood dripping from his mouth, as he looked at Moldovan, let out a guttable growl. Moldovan kept the rifle ready, as he didn't know what would happen. Goliath stood up on his hind legs and let out an unearthly deafening roar that shook everybody to the core. He looked at Moldovan and slowly went back to all fours. Moldovan lowered the rifle and Goliath came to him and gently shoved his head against Moldovan's chest. And Gaius trotted over and laid down on his belly 
putting his head between his paws in a submissive gesture. Hawks and Jack were in awe and completely silent until Jack shouted, Judge, Hoag, and Backy! They ran in a direction to find Hoag kneeling over Church's body. He pointed to the tree where Backy lay. It was over, and it came at a great cost. Part 10. Victory without celebration. Let's get straight into that. They gathered the bodies of Church and Backy so they could transport them to Austria, because no man is left behind. Goliath and Gaia stayed slightly ahead on watch for Nazis during the journey back. And when they made it to the woods near the train station, Hoag went ahead to contact British intelligence and notify them that they would be waiting at the extraction point. And Moldovan and the dogs were transported back to England also. Upon arrival back at RAF Mildenhall, they were greeted by LTC Atkins and Mike Cochran. And Cochran extended an offer to Moldovan for he and the Wolves to return to the United States. And he accepted. And Jack and Hawks were to accompany them back to the States. And after helping Moldovan and the Wolves get settled into their new homes, they would be given 15 days leave to visit their families before going to their new units. A big homecoming party was held for Jack and Esther told him that she was pregnant. And after a huge feast, White Feather approached Jack and said, Grey Wolf, the Cree men asked me to give you something. It was a necklace and with a large canine tooth mounted on a twisted leather strap. And with this, the Great Spirit Wolf will guide you. Epilogue Many know the cost of sacrifice, but few know the value. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a chest pounding and fantastic story that was from our good friend Rico, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. It's incredible, Rico, that you haven't really ever taken up writing as a hobby or profession. You really do have the knack for it, my friend. And I can't wait to see what else you produce in the near future. Big thank you, of course, for choosing this channel and myself to present your incredible work, and I really hope you enjoy the narration, as ever. Well, guys and girls, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. My well, age really does help both the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you want to have a crack of things or perhaps you're an experienced writer and would like me to narrate your story on the show, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. What a fantastic way to end the weekend, and I hope you all had an amazing time with friends or family, and a fighting fit and staying sharp and focused. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.